Andrea Getz. Andrea Getz obtained her PhD in physics at Caltech in 1992 after the, which she moved to the University of Arizona as a public level fellow. After that, she uh, started a faculty position at UCLA in 1994, where she's been ever since and is now having an endowed chair. Uh, for her research, which we'll do today about, uh, she obtained a number of awards, which would be too many to this, but I'll just mention a few. Namely, the Macalafo Genius Award, uh, the fact that she's a member of the National Academies, and the Packard Award. Uh, Andrea developed new high resolution imaging techniques to peer into the center of our Milky Way, and she's one of the two world leaders to show the best observational proof that supermassive black holes truly exist in our own backyard, namely the Milky Way center. Um, and as I mentioned, if you hear some rumbling, it's not earthquakes, but the subway is coming in Europe. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, and to share that we, the work that we've been doing over the past 20 years um, with the Keck Observatory. Um, the work that we, or the question that we set out to answer when we first started this project is the question of is there a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy? And what I hope to convince you uh, in the lecture today is that the answer is a resounding yes and that this has provided us not only with the best evidence to date that supermassive black holes exist, but has provided us with a wonderful laboratory for uh, understanding the physics and astrophysics of black holes. Now, um, the, the work that I'm going to describe today, um, the story is both a scientific story and a story of the advancement of technology. So over the last 20 years, um, the way that we've been able to collect the data has changed dramatically. Um, so this is equally a story about progress in technology. Now, before I go forward, I also want to acknowledge that this work has been done in collaboration with a, a wonderful team of people, and in particular, my long-term collaborators, um, uh, my colleagues, um, Mark Morris and Eric Becklin at UCLA, along with a large number of students and postdocs and researchers whose work I'll discuss today. Now, from the, there are two big picture perspectives on what we're doing. On the physics side, we're interested in understanding um, do supermassive black holes exist and also understanding the complete description of gravity. In other words, we have an opportunity to look into testing general relativity in a regime that has not been tested before. So this is one aspect from the physics perspective. On the astronomy side, we'd like to understand what role black holes play in the formation and evolution of galaxies. And when this work started, um, we had a very different perspective than we do today in terms of the important role that supermassive black holes play um, in, our, in regulating um, the growth of galaxies. So to begin with, uh, and I do want to begin at the beginning um, because I realize this is a broad audience, we might ask, well, why did people come to um, think about the existence of supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies? And by supermassive black holes, I mean black holes that are a million to a billion times the mass of the sun, so very different than the stellar mass black holes which were thought of from a theoretical perspective and th when people thought about the evolution of very massive stars. So the supermassive black hole case came from actually observations rather than theory, and in particular observations of galaxies which are known as active galactic nuclei. Um, so these are galaxies which represent roughly 10% of the galaxy population, and these galaxies emit a tremendous amount of energies uh, from their centers, and hence their name. Uh, uh, active galactic nuclei because the nuclei or centers are rather active. And this is a picture that's taken at radio wavelengths, so you're not seeing the starlight, but rather at the center here, um, we're seeing um, um, a center of the galaxy that shows very energetic phenomena. And, and what was hypothesized is that energetic phenomena, which does not look like starlight, came from matter falling um, onto the black hole. The other piece of evidence uh, for the case of black holes was that out emanating out from the center of these galaxies and the full extended galaxies, actually quite small, were enormous jets of emission. 
And these jets, you can measure the, kinem uh, uh, the kinetic energy by just measuring the velocities, um, was tremendously high. And again, that gave rise to the idea that was that there had to be something very strong, uh, strong central potential that drove these powerful jets. Uh, and there was strong and very high gas velocities were observed at the center of these galaxies. So that gave rise to the notion that perhaps um, active galactic nuclei harbored supermassive black holes and, their, uh, and this energetic phenomena was driven by large um, uh, amounts of matter being dumped onto the black hole. Now that gave rise to the idea roughly 40 years ago, or the question, do all galaxies, including the normal non-active galaxies, have quiet black holes lurking at their centers? And if you're going to ask that question, the Milky Way is certainly the best place to address it. The pro of looking at the center of our galaxy is that it's the closest example of, the center, of a center of a galaxy that we're ever going to have um, to study. The next closest galaxy is 100 times further away. So you have the ability to see far more detail because it's so close. The con, because of course in life is usually a con for every pro, um, is that we live in our own galaxy. Our galaxy is a flattened disk-like structure. So um, when we are observing the center of the galaxy, we have to look through the plane of our galaxy. And not only, uh, and the, our galaxy has not only a lot of stars, but it actually has a lot of dust. I'm from Los Angeles, I have a very good feeling of what that means. Dust is a very good absorber, an absorber of um, wavelengths of light that are comparable to the dust size. So if you go to the optical, um, only one out of a 10 billion photons makes it to us from the center of the galaxy. So it's basically a, a really good screen. You're not going to see the center of the galaxy at optical wavelengths. And this is a picture that's taken at op optical wavelengths. So you see the plane of the galaxy with the starlight, but you also see this very effective dust screen. If you go to the infrared, and in particular two microns, which is where I've done all my work, one, of every, one out of every 10 photons makes it to us. So you can actually see to the center of the galaxy. Now, once you can see to the center of the galaxy, the best way to look for a supermassive black hole is through, their, um, through um, the gravitational influence of the black hole onto uh, things around it. So this is looking at the stars as little test particles. And um, our job is to show that there's a lot of mass confined to a small volume. And ideally, you would confine that mass to within its short shield radius. Um, can I just ask one yes. of the previous slides? So you said the next closest black center is 100 times further away. If it has a black hole 100 times larger than mass, right. everything scales up as a short shield radius, and that would be equally good right. for observing. So right. it's not totally obvious from that argument that it wouldn't be better to look at Andromeda. Because um, we don't. Right. Um, except that you're still stuck with the resolution of your telescope and how close you can get to the black hole. But it would be 100 times larger and 100 times further away. You would Right. Although the stars would be fainter. Uh, no, but it goes a square. Uh, let's see. What's wrong with this <laughs> argument? The time scale. Uh, stars would be fainter, so you would still need to take longer exposures with the depth of the stars. The stars are a little bit sort of at the short end. Right, but the relative region scales up with the short shield radius. But the time scales don't, right? So yeah, if you go to the. Long. Right. But right, this, all right. Yes, a lot. <laughs> so we're limited by our human <laughs> lifetime. So in fact, I'm going to come back to this concept. Because while there are some things that seem so obvious now in terms of this work, um, at the moment they weren't so obvious. OK. Uh, the other question which is related is, what made you say it was at the center when you're looking at the active black nuclei? Because you said the the galaxy is one tenth the size of those jets. So what made How us? Can you tell what, whether you're at the center or? So it was not only the jets, but there was also unusual emission coming out from the center. And you um, knew it was at the center as opposed to somewhere else in the galaxy. Well, and in fact, David and I were talking about this yesterday when we started this work. It wasn't so obvious, but it has become quite clear 
that the black holes, the, the supermassive black holes, really are at the dynamical center Not just, uh, in, our, in our galaxy, but well, for uh, all for our ability. And again, our galaxy we can f measure far better than any other galaxy. Wow. So it is absolutely true here, we, wow. um, and or at least to the ability that we can measure it. But wow. it is, um, and in other galaxies, it's consistent um, with that statement. Um, it's reasonable to think that it would be at the center of the galaxy because, of course, it's the most massive object in the system. So dynamically, you would expect it to eventually sink to the center. Um, so um, it, it, from that perspective, you might also argue from a theoretical perspective that you would expect it to be at the center. There's caveats to that, though. Okay. Um, we are going to use stars as a tracer. And um, there are two approaches. And I like to call this, as this is actually appropriate for David's question, the impatient uh, method. Or I used to joke, this is like the pre-tenure method. I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> um, so, And if you're going to do that, you're just going to look at the velocities of a bunch of stars. And you're going to statistically convert, argue or convert um, ensemble measurements of velocities as a function of radius into enclosed masses. That works extremely well and it's what we do in all other galaxies. In our galaxy, we have the afford, uh, um, ability to be patient, or you could say the post-tenure um, um, ability to be patient. And in principle, you can watch these stars make complete orbits. If you, and and that, that's going to be viable if you really believe that there's a supermassive black hole at the center. This comes back to the lifetime argument. <laughs> okay. But let's look at um, sort of how this came to pass. So um, the first hint that there was a dark mass at the center of the galaxy came from observations um, of gas. So at the center of the galaxy, the center of the galaxy is actually a rather extreme environment compared to where we are out here. You could call it the galactic suburbs. Actually, right. Um, the center of the galaxy is like New York. It's the urban metropolis of our, of our galaxy. And like New York, it is kind of <laughs> intense. Um, there are intense gas, uh, there's um, lots of gas, there's a um, lot of stars, the, t the star density is, is, increases as you go to the center, um, there are very strong magnetic fields, everything becomes more extreme as you work your way to the center of the galaxy. And um, so early on, people made measurements of the velocities of gas at large distances and working on it. So here is the enclosed mass as a function of radius. And this is using um, the velocity approach from large distances all the way in. Now, um, the, the measurements are in color. And then the, the line shows you if you just assume a mass to light ratio. In other words, if you just measure the light and assume that it's all locked up in stars, how much mass would you infer? And so at large distances from the center of the galaxy, the dynamical masses are consistent with your inference uh, from the starlight. And this works all the way into the center until you get to these closer radii. And at distances, you're working it with gas structures that are at the center of the galaxy that were explored by Charlie Towns's group up at Berkeley. And that was the first hint in um, the late 80s that perhaps there was a dynamical mass inference that was larger than what the, was trapped in stars. This is always enclosed mass. And at that time, this was roughly 3 million times the mass of the sun inside, inside some incredibly large region, um, people were very hesitant to claim that this was a black hole uh, for a number of reasons. One, it was a large region. And two, gas can be um, moved around by a lot of other things. So winds from massive stars, magnetic fields. There's a lot of activity or forces in particular that can drive the velocities to be higher. <laughs> So um, if you read that paper, there's like one sentence that says maybe. It's really hidden in that paper because of that reason. Um, but in fact, people then um, started measuring the motions of stars at these distances and similarly found very high velocities along the line of sight that you can measure spectroscopically, which confirmed, uh, you know, it's hard to push the stars around, um, that there was in fact evidence for dark matter. This was work done by um, Chris Seldrin. <laughs> They didn't know. No, no, right, right, oh, right. right. Now, now, now we know. So this, but this is the first hint. So early on, you know, it was evidence. Um, 
But in fact, at that time, there were a lot of alternatives um, suggested. So clusters of dark objects. And in fact, the particle physicists got into the act and started proposing this idea of fermion balls. So these were they are equivalent to neutron stars. But rather than made of being made of neutrons, they're made of fermions. So they're more compact. They're basically uniform density objects that are just a little bigger than the Schwarzschild radius. But to rule these um, ideas out, uh, both, the astro um, uh, both ideas, you need to get to higher, higher resolution in order to confine the mass to smaller volumes to, con uh, to claim that this is a supermassive black hole. And this led to two independent high resolution imaging studies that have been going on for the last 20 years. Um, uh, uh, the first um, that got going was that by Reinhard Genzel um, in Germany. And he started off on the three meter telescope and then moved to the eight meter telescope in Chile. And then there was my group that started with um, the Keck 10 meter um, telescope. So while they got going two years or three years earlier, the resolution put us equal on equal footing very quickly. This is Hawaii. This is Hawaii. The Keck telescopes are over in Hawaii. The Keck telescopes are co-owned by the University of California um, and Caltech, and then one six partnership with NASA. They are. Uh, uh, they are the world's largest telescopes. They're why I went to UCLA. I was desperate to get my hands on these. Having been trained at Caltech, I was spoiled <laughs> from the get-go. Um, OK, so both groups actually used um, the same technique in the beginning. So everyone understood with these large telescopes that the, um, the ultimate way to correct for the atmospheric distortions, um, actually, let me step one step back. Big telescopes are great because you can collect a lot of light. So you can see things that are very faint. And in principle, um, big telescopes are great because they give you very high angular resolution. And that second concept um, has been much harder to achieve because of the, the Earth's atmosphere. So the Earth's atmosphere is a total headache for um, people studying astrophysical objects. Um, and hence, you put up a space telescope, which definitely solves the problem. But you have much bigger telescopes on the ground. So Keck is a 10 meter telescope, and Hubble Space Telescope is a 2.4 meter telescope. So that's four times bigger. And for the kind of work that I do, it goes as the diameter to the fourth power. So that's more than a factor of 100 gain over Hubble if you can figure out how to beat the atmosphere. So hence, um, the work that we've done, um, which mo a lot of my work has been driven um, by techniques for correcting for the Earth's atmosphere. Um, so both groups use this technique of, called speckle imaging. You find this in many fields. And basically, you're, you're treating the atmosphere as introducing um, there's a coherence length of the atmosphere. And so you can think of what happens as like a bunch of Young's double slit um, experiments. Uh, so you basically get the wave front interfering uh, between these two patches, and you get an interference pattern. But you have many of them. So you get this speckle pattern. And um, if there were no atmosphere, each of these bright five stars would be the size of the smallest structures that you're seeing dancing around. But because of the atmosphere, um, it looks like a bug splat pattern. And it's changing on very short time scales. So in, in the infrared, this changes on a time scale of about a tenth of a second. Um, and at shorter wavelengths, it would change even uh, more quickly. But you can see each star is actually um, suffering the same problem. So you can correct for this. So the early technique was basically you make um, it's hardware simple. So we only had to change um, the scale of the, of the imager that was already at the telescope and figure out how to make the electronics read faster. So that's a, rather, that's a really pretty modest modification. Although in hindsight, I think it's amazing that at Keck Observatory, an assistant professor can show up and say, I'd like to make a change to your telescope. And they go along with it. Um, for the sake of the grad students in the audience, the other story I like to say at this point, um, and kind of coming back to David's point, I, I started at UCLA in 1994. And I was so excited about being at UCLA and that I had access to the CAC, and we'd made this modification. I f wrote my first proposal to say we were going to do this experiment. And they wrote back saying, we're not going to give you any telescope time. Not only is your silly technique going to not work, but you won't see any motions, <laughs> which point you feel like saying, go back and take freshman physics, because if Charlie Towns was right, this is going to be easy. <laughs> Um, and so fortunately, I have very nice colleagues at UCLA, and somebody lent me their telescope time. And that's kind of amazing, realizing that telescope time is valued at about 100,000 a night. Um, it's really precious time. But they did. And um, with this uh, approach, we were able to make uh, an image that looks like this on the central part of this image. This is the, resolu the size of this box is basically the resolution of an image. <coughs> 
if you had no, if you didn't do anything. So you can finally see the stars that are at the center of the galaxy. This is not cleaned up, no deconvolution. It's basically straight out of the box what you would get. And it was a very simple technique, actually. And now I'm going to show you, rather than um, a single night, just an animation that shows you one image every year. And you, you, know, you don't need a computer to tell you that there are fast-moving stars at the center of the galaxy. You just look at that image. And you can probably find my favorite star in the universe um, damn, trucking around. OK, so this is the first decade. Um, but fortunately, there's been a huge evolution in um, how um, we take these images. There's a technique called adaptive optics now, and the astronomers, were, um, were, you know, we were working very hard on this technique because, of course, we knew that this was the future, but it turns out that other people were also working on this because, of course, the military also cares about looking up and down through the atmosphere and had gotten a lot farther. So in the mid-90s or early 90s, they declassified it. So that, means, that meant that this field took a huge leap forward um, in the mid-90s. So adaptive optics, I understand Claire Max was here recently, so that means I get to um, not dwell on this very long, um, since you're now all experts on this, on this technique. The magic is really in this deformable mirror. This deformable mirror, so if there were no atmosphere, the wavefront would be flat. Because of the atmosphere, it's corrugated. So the job of the adaptive optic system is to introduce a mirror that is the exact opposite shape um, to the wavefront that hits it. Now, the atmosphere is changing on short time scales, so you have to make to change this deformable mirror on very short time scales. So that's, this, is, this is the work, and you have to look at something that tells you how to change it. And the key here was um, the uh, um, advent of laser guide stars. So laser guide stars um, is, is uh, important because you could create a star that was bright enough anywhere that you wanted to look to tell you how to move that deformable mirror. And because of a fluke of nature, there's actually a layer of sodium atoms up at 90 kilometers that's trapped there. So you take a sodium laser and stimulate those sodium atoms to shine. Um, and that is the beauty of adaptive optics. Okay. Um, I like to talk about this because it turns out this technology has been in the world of astrophysics for a long time. When I was a grad student, people were talking about this, talking about this, talking about this. I've, I wrote for 20 years proposals to use um, the telescope in this mode with engineers, and we didn't do a stitch of science until 10 years ago. So I just wanted to emphasize here that adaptive optics has come of age. You can go to the telescope and use this technology. You turn it on, and it really works. Um, it is no longer a fringe technology. This is the two cat telescopes working um, uh, with adaptive optics. It's like a big laser pointing to pointer telling you where the center of the galaxy is. And in fact, this is one evening when we had all four telescopes on the Mauna Kea pointing to the center of the galaxy. I'll tell you why in a minute. <laughs> there was an event. Those are just straight up photographs. These are photographs. They are not. PowerPoint, like they are not doctored up, but it is true that a camera can integrate for longer than your eyeball can. Your eye is integrating every one, thir you know, a thirtieth of a second. So if you stand underneath here, underneath the telescope, you will not see it this way. You'll see something very faint if you get right under the telescope. But this is a long exposure and not doctored. <laughs> well, it's light because actually there, um, there's the moonlight. Oh, but it is scaled, obviously. It's not that light. So the contrast is being played with. But it's not, there's no color added. Um, I thought that when I first saw these images. <laughs> Just too, too amazing. OK, all right. So um, this improves your ability to take images at the center of the galaxy on the <laughs> on the left is the original. And again, this is just that little postage stamp is the speckle imaging. And on the right, we have the more advanced adaptive optic system uh, picture. In almost any way, you can quantify the quality of this image. It's about a factor of 10 better. It's a factor of, you can see stars that are a factor of 10 fainter. And you can position the stars a factor of 10 better. And for the first time, we can actually t um, take an exposure that's longer than a tenth of a second so we can get spectra. And of course, that means that we have a lot more information. So the spectra allow us to measure the velocity along the line of sight and actually to start measuring the astrophysical properties of the, of the stars that we've really been treating as point source, um, point source probes of the gravitational potential before. What, what is the time scale of the, <coughs> of the adaptive optic system. Um, we make corrections roughly um, a thousand times a second. 
Um, so um, a lot of the art of adaptive optics system is um, the computational challenge of figuring out what to do and then making the mirror, um, designing the mirror with enough flexibility to make those corrections on, on those kinds of time scales. And that's also why you don't make those mirrors. So Keck is a segmented mirror, so you might ask why not work with a primary mirror? And the answer is it's too, um, it's too hard to move around the, the pieces of glass. So rather than working with a 10 meter uh, mirror, you've re-imaged the primary onto a deformable mirror that's about this big. Okay. And it has about 350 actuators that are moving up and down. All right, um, I'm gonna skip. We work a lot on, on methodology. So of course, once you know that there are a lot more stars, you start to work harder on your original data. So we've actually gone back to all our original speckle data to improve our analysis and dig those stars out. Um, and today, we um, are able to see these stars now move. Um, this is now the animation. And um, I'm now showing you a quarter of the real estate that we were looking at before. I mean, I used to think that little post is, oh, why is it not moving? I'll be sad if this doesn't show. Okay. Okay, it is going to show. Um, so this is a quarter of the real estate, shows how the stars have moved over the last 20 years. And um, uh, the coding here is that if a star has been measured in an image, it's trailed with a dashed line. So stars do appear like this one, only because the adaptive optic systems see stars that are fainter. And then once you can take a spectrum of it, which um, allows you to measure the velocity along your line of sight, you're trailed by a solid line. So you can probably tell from this why SO2 is such an important star, because it's been through a complete orbit. The orbital period of this guy is only 16 years. So, you know, again, you're seeing something on a human lifetime. You know, the sun takes 100 million years to go around the center of the galaxy. This is only 16 years. So you can do, you know, this is the, um, you're doing kinds of experiments that you can only do in, in, at the center of our galaxy. Okay. So. Oh yeah, this is where we're going, but it's not where we're there yet. We're not there yet. So I also wanted to show you the real data, not just an animation. So on the left is the images. And these are images, or the positions, I should say. This is the positions that have all been put into the same, a common reference frame. <laughs> uh, turns out that's a very hard problem, and especially if you want to do this over 20 years, uh, because everything in your picture is moving. Um, so when we first started to realize that things weren't coming back to the exact same place, we got very excited about precession or the possibility of a black hole binary, and then we realized that, in fact, this is just your imperfections and your ability to uh, put everything in the same reference frame. So, in fact, the, the, the reference frame is drifting with respect to the black hole, or you could say that vice versa, that the black hole is drif drifting with respect to your reference frame. Anyway, it's closed. Uh, so. Um, um, this shows the radial velocity, the velocity along your line of sight. And I just want you to notice the units here. This is in uh, thousands of kilometers per second. Um, you could only do this once adaptive optics turned on. It was a very early instrument, and in fact, we couldn't make the measurement at that point. But once you've actually figured out the orbit, you can go back to your data and, and pull, it, pull it out. In the space of a few months, it um, underwent a change of 6,000 kilometers per second. Um, and it's unfortunate that we didn't have good enough control of our Keplerian orbit to realize that was happening at that time. Doesn't, doesn't matter, it's gonna happen again. It's gonna happen in 2018. So a lot of the group right now is about 2018 or bust because in fact at this point, as I'm gonna say in a minute, you can start to probe the effects of general relativity. But before I get to there, let's just come back to the case for a black hole which is where we started. Um, the case for a black hole. So you have an orbit that goes around every 16 years. You have the semi-major axis. This is freshman physics. Call it Kepler, call it Newton's um, version, but it allows you to calculate the central mass. And the size of the orbit, in particular the closest approach, tells you the size to which you can find, or the region to which you can find the mass. And in fact, um, so we now have four million times the mass of the sun inside a, a region that corresponds roughly to the size of our solar system. And that has increased the dark matter density that's inferred at the center of the galaxy by a factor of 10 million. In other words, that's the, that's the extent to which you've improved the case for a supermassive black hole. <coughs> In fact, the argument for the existence of supermassive black holes can be um, depicted in this dark hole, ma um, dark mass density versus black hole or uh, mass plot. 
And you basically have a good case when you're above this green line, because at that point, the time scale for clusters of dark objects are, is shorter than the age of, your gal of the galaxy. Okay? So in the beginning with Charlie Towns, you were sort of there, but now um, this was velocity dispersions at large radii. The early days of our experiment, it was velocity dispersions with, uh, with speckle imaging, and now orbits put you way up here, and there's no al other galaxy that can touch it. Okay. You've also ruled out the fermion ball hypothesis and come up with the conclusion that a supermassive black hole exists at the center of the galaxy, and in fact, it's the best case for a supermassive black hole at the center of any galaxy. Okay. Um, so actually, I should be a little bit more careful, especially with this uh, physics audience. So what um, you do here is um, the, the, the density allows you to put a limit on the particle mass for the fermion. Um, and that also puts a limit for the maximum mass that the fermion ball hypothesis can sustain. And for that mass, it's 10 to the eighth solar masses. So if you look at, it's actually, um, if you look at the range of masses that supermassive black holes um, come in, they go all the way up to 10 to the ninth. So in other words, you can't use that fermion ball to explain all supermassive black holes. Okay, okay thanks. It, um, it's the idea that it's uh, an object that's made up just of fermions. So in the same way that a neutron star is uh, composed of just neut neutrons, a fermion balls would be uh, an object that's pure fermions. Oh, I see. Like a more, uh, um, um, you pick your, a more, a gen, sorry, a more generalized, you pick your particle mass and we'll, we'll give you the, the density. So, the, um, so you can get actually objects that are far, once you generalize it, you can get to um, scales that are much smaller and just outside the event horizon. I think you mean bottom stars, but people said, I mean, not fermion, but bottom. I think both. So you can. Um, so fermions, we, we know. What, I mean, uh, unless you want to introduce a hypothetical fermion. Yeah, these are these are these are some type of very small which 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 can go composite by something very small scales, and then you can come to some. I mean, there's a series of papers where, the, where people have published this idea and worked out various um, possible um, particle energies. Um, I mean, it was, very, it, was great, it was great fun at this point where people were debating it. Um, and it beca this, this idea became very hot when we were basically at, at this scale. Um, and then, of course, once we go up here, you impose a maximum, a maximum size, which then um, prevents one type of object for, for explaining all of them. So yes, it is still a somewhat indirect argument, just to be, to be really fair. Yeah, yeah. Right. Absolutely. Um, well, so just to, I, I guess the thing that I should be saying. So we've made a big deal that your 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 volume is smaller, but you could equivalently ask how what's the radius that you've um, you've com um, constrained the mass to compared to the Schwarzschild radius, and it's roughly um, about 500 times the Schwarzschild radius. So there is you know there's still room, um, but you've made a lot of progress. Okay. Yeah, that's what I meant. Bosom stars or something. Yeah. So, boson stars? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, there, there is, there is space. Um, I guess is the, is the, the response then. Um, yes. So let's, um, and, and let me come back to that because this might be interesting in terms of what we can do next. Um, so you can do better, and of course you want to do better for a number of reasons with these orbits. You want to do better uh, because um, you want a very accurate distance to the center of the galaxy. So people who study the structure of our galaxy, the distance between us and the center of the galaxy is a fundamental parameter. 
And using the orbits of the center of the galaxy, it's a very classic measurement. You can just get the distance out of it. And once SO2 goes through its next closest approach, you will be at a distance precision of uh, one, uh, roughly 1%, which is exciting to those who study um, the structure of our Milky Way. It is also true that folks who, who do the Event Horizon Telescope care about the ratio, the mass to um, the distance of the center of the galaxy, because that's the size of the shadow of the black hole that that experiment is looking at. And they assume that you can get the mass divided by radius um, to less than 4%, which actually comes from these measurements. So this is just a classic thing that will fall right out of our measurements. We're excited about that, but I'd have to say what's even more exciting to me is um, going beyond the Keplerian orbit. Going beyond the Keplerian orbit in order to test Einstein's, um, our ideas of, um, of gravity. Um, so this plots, I think, most of the existing tests of, um, of general relativity. So you know, we know gravity is one of the four fundamental uh, forces. And there are, very few, there are actually very incredibly few tests of this, uh, this theory. So we have a very important one recently with LIGO. But the orbits of stars, and that 16-year period start, its name is SO2. It probably needs a, needs a better name, but that's its name. Um, sits out here in a, in a phase space that's pretty unproved. So on the bottom here, we have log of mass. And on the top here, we have log of the gravitational potential. For black holes, you can think of that as um, how far you are out from the um, event horizon of the Schwarzschild radius. So um, what we're after in terms of going beyond the Keplerian model is a couple of fold. So first, um, from the physics perspective, we can measure the gravitational redshift, which describes um, the, the effect of the curvature of space time on um, the, of, on photons. So in other words, when you measure the Doppler shift with spectroscopy, there's going to be an extra piece um, that's a the, um, that comes from our description of gravity. I hope you can see this. This is a new animation. I'm sort of saying it's a little hard to see. So you, tra um, you trace the orbit of the star going th um, through um, uh, the potential. And on the top is the difference between um, the Keplerian or the Newton description of, the, of, the, of how things should move versus Einstein's description. And at closest approach, which will happen in 2018, there's a really significant difference. There's a difference of about 200 kilometers per second, and each measurement you can make to about 20 kilometers per second. So what it really depends on is your absolute control of the classical description, your, cl your classical descriptions, your, the parameters that are described by the Keplerian orbit. And now that we actually have a complete orbit, we are in full command of those terms. So this should be relatively easy to detect in 2018. So we're really excited about 2018. The next thing that you should be able to detect is the precession of the periaps. This is like the um, Mercury's uh, precession as a test. But again, it's the uh, first test of, um, uh, of Einstein's theory of gravity around a supermassive black hole. So this orbit should come back not to where it started, but it should be um, uh, it should overshoot. So you get a prograde precession of the periaps. So that's how the stars tra uh, 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 travels um, through space time. And then ultimately, you also want to measure the spin <laughs> of the black hole, although that's not in the reach of today's technology. I think this is the game of the 30 meter telescope. Um, but it is um, still something you can get with the orbits. The other thing that you would like to do is to measure the astrophysical um, uh, uh, influences of dark matter. So, or you could also alternatively say if the object is bigger and you're actually um, probe, you know, going within this um, uh, extended mass. So you might ask, well, what do you expect to reside in the orbit of SO2? And it turns out, well, if you think you know what's at the center of the galaxy, and I'm about to tell you that every prediction that we've made has been inconsistent with the observations. So you should take all of this with an enormous grain of salt. But um, the mass should be dominated from, the, from um, baryons in terms of stellar mass black holes. And this should be about 1,000 times the mass of the sun within SO2's orbit. It's a very eccentric orbit. So um, the, um, the three-dimensional distance varies by quite a bit um, through the course of its orbit. And there should be also um, dark matter, cold dark matter particles, in equal amounts based on what we know about our theories um, for what should reside at the center of the galaxy. So we are very excited about the future of precision orbit um, from a physics uh, perspective. And time will help us, for sure. 
um, as well as um, more advanced adaptive optic systems. So, you know, astronomers are always going to tell you, we want more. <laughs> we want more from our technology, not only in terms of uh, telescope size, but also in terms of how this adaptive optic system works. So let me just say a, a word or two about that. Um, uh, we're today, Adaptive optics works by shining one laser up into the sodium layer. And this is a really not to scale at all cartoon. So this is a 10 meter telescope. This is 90 kilometers up. <laughs> so this is your mirror. This is your sodium beacon. And um, the light that's probed by the laser, oops. Oh, it's not going to work at all. Never mind. I'm going to have to work, walk my way through this. OK. So um, this is what's probed by one, uh, one laser, but there's a whole bunch of atmosphere that's missed. And you can see the bigger your telescope, the bigger the problem is. This is called the cone effect. So for today's telescopes at two microns, you can only at most correct half the problem. Only half the problem. Of course, we're really happy with what has happened with half the problem. So our um, ambition is to take one laser, and that is, now power that, is, that is really a picture of one laser, long exposure, obviously. Um, and we'd like to divide it up into multiple beacons so that you can do basically a CAT scan on the atmosphere. Now, um, this problem with the cone effect just gets bigger for larger and larger telescopes. So when people are talking about the more advanced telescopes of the 30 meter telescope or the giant Magellan telescope or the European extremely large telescope, they all assume that this technology is working. And yet it's not really an operation on the current generation of telescopes. So this is, I think, a really important thing to be doing next on large ground-based telescopes, on the existing telescopes for the benefit of the future telescopes. There are these future telescopes. These are rather amazing instruments. These will be the largest moving structures ever built on the planet Earth. <laughs> Just to name a few of the problems, the technical problems that have to be overcome. <laughs> the size of the mirror is 30 meters. That's like the um, inside of a, that's a, that's a baseball diamond. Um, uh, these telescope, that telescope will have roughly 490 uh, little elements uh, in, the, in the mirror. So it's a really phenomenal um, instrument. And we think that with um, uh, any of these telescopes with adaptive optics, we'll take the picture that looks like this for the Keck era, and um, we'll see uh, many more stars, roughly in the order of magnitude. Sometimes I joke that that's something like um, a beehive. And the time scales get shorter, which means I don't have to be quite as patient. So we get down to two years instead of 15 years, which in terms of making the next step is really great. Now, I have mentioned that the, um, the environment looks very different than what we, uh, we expected. And um, why were we thinking about what the environment looked like? We were thinking about it because we think today that black holes form, um, uh, play a very important role in terms of um, the formation and evolution of galaxy. And that's really relatively new thinking because in fact when we first started reporting our results on the existence of a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, the question used to be which came first, the galaxy or the black hole? It's like the chicken or the egg question. But today we realize it's the wrong question. They have came together. And they came together, the, um, the, the idea that they came together came from the idea that people are seeing that the mass of the black holes at the centers of galaxies seem to be correlated to the mass of the central component of the galaxy. And the scale here is vastly different. So this is basically one one thousandth, a thousandth, one one thousand, one over a thousand, um, the mass of the, the central part of the galaxy known as the bulge. So today we think that whatever formed the galaxy formed the black hole, and that there's some feedback loop that keeps them in sync. So we think that the, the black hole plays an important role. And our galaxy is the only place in which you can measure the orbits of stars around a supermassive black hole, giving you really new insight, unique handle on this feedback. We'd like to know all sorts of things. Um, now, actually, I've already said this. Um, maybe in the interest of time, I will just use this animation um, as a device. So there's all sorts of interesting things that we see. One is that um, the prediction is that you should see no young stars. The second prediction is that you should see lots of old stars. And then, we didn't, um, and then we didn't make predictions for something else that we actually see. Um, let me, um, actually, I'll just use this. Okay. So the young stars are um, green, or aqua. So the prediction is no young stars. We see tons of them. The <coughs> prediction for the old stars is that you should see a lot of them. Um, and yet, they're the orange ones. You see a few of them. And then the magenta things is, are, are the things that are perplexing us today. So to just give you, again, the, the physics behind those statements, the young star prediction is just um, the calculation 
But to get star formation to go, proceed, you need um, self-gravity of a gas cloud to overcome any um, uh, internal forces. And given the densities that we see at the center of the galaxy today, this is an enormous contradiction given the tidal forces that are introduced by the black hole. So you would need densities that are more than a factor of um, 10 billion times higher than, um, sorry, uh, 10 to the, I didn't do my math right here, um, uh, 10 to the eighth, right, 10 to the eighth. 10 to, uh, 10, 10, mil, uh, 100, 10 to the eighth, 100 million is uh, the difference. But anyway, it's a big difference um, uh, in terms of densities. And of course, the theorists went to town in terms of coming up with ideas about how you can resolve this um, apparent contradictions, that you do see young stars um, that are there. And the ideas were, maybe they're not young stars. <laughs> maybe they're just somehow altered by the environment. Maybe they're um, infused with dark matter particles, which make them look dark different. I mean, again, there have been all sorts of ideas. Maybe there are young stars that formed really far away where the den tidal densities were low and you migrate them incredibly quickly. But again, it has to be incredibly quickly. Or maybe they really formed in situ. And the thing that has been pointing us to the in situ argument is that if you look at this animation, and I am going to use this animation, you could also plot, which is an, uh, another plot that I have here, just the normal vectors of all these orbits. And you see a collection of the normal vectors. Actually, let me show you that. That's the more physics-y version. OK, so you take all the orbits that you know about. You can solve for how well you know the normal vectors. And then you um, plot the ensemble of normal vectors. And you, and you see a preferred direction. What that means is that these orbits are um, orbiting in a common plane. That three-dimensional animation also showed it very nicely. But of course, you didn't know the uncertainties very well. So this shows you your true knowledge. And that suggests that, in fact, in situ formation um, is, is an interesting idea. And the idea here is that perhaps in the past there were much higher gas densities um, provided by an infall of a, uh, of a lot of material as perhaps um, a little satellite galaxy um, was merged with our, with our galaxy. So that's not an unreasonable explanation. Now the idea that came from, from the old stars is if you calculate um, the interaction between a massive black hole with a, a, a group of particles that have been surrounding it for a very long time, you expect a density cusp. In other words, there should be a, a, a spike in the density of these particles or stars um, around the, um, the center of the galaxy. And this actually idea has been used for a long time to look at for black holes in other galaxies because you expect an enhancement of starlight at the center from those old stars that have been around for a long time. That prediction is important for finding black holes and also understanding the evolution of black holes in terms of like maybe how um, um, two galaxies merge because you need to know what it's migrating against. But of course, that's not what we saw. We saw very few old stars. And again, to show you the data rather than an animation, this is the surface density of stars, young stars and old stars. And it's flat. There's no cusp here. Um, so that's two very big mysteries. And again, there's lots of explanations for why this is inconsistent. I want you to just, yeah. Um, let's see. Thank you. Okay. Again, what? Um, I was avoiding that because it's like, what unit do you care about? <laughs> is it? Um, maybe the unit that one might care about are these are all the stars with very short period orbits. So this is roughly um, a few thousand short shield radii. That may be giving you a, a useful scale in terms of arc seconds. Thanks for asking. Um, um, OK. Now, um, there's a lot more that can be done in terms of figuring out this mystery. And there are a lot of explanations ranging from the old stars are actually much larger than young stars. In other words, they have an extended envelope. So one idea is maybe you just strip off that envelope. And if you do that, they become faint. In fact, they become fainter than your ability to detect them. So that's an interesting idea. But for a long time, people said, well, look, the density of stars are not high enough to do this stripping game. But there's a new observation that's making me think about this again. And again, lots of papers written on lots of different ideas. So what's the new observation? The new observation is the magenta objects. The magenta objects have gotten a lot of um, publicity in the last two years. So for the astronomy community, or the astrophysics community, there was an object known as G2. G2 appeared in the papers because, um, in the newspapers, because um, 
It was clearly an object, it was the first object, the first example of an object that was experiencing tidal disruption around a supermassive black hole that you could spatially resolve. It was actually being caught in the act. It was on a very eccentric orbit, and when we was far away, it was doing nothing in particular, and as it got closer and closer, it got more and more elongated. In other words, you could see the tidal um, tails, uh, both in the front and behind it, and that was very exciting. And people said, well, maybe it's a gas cloud, and when it reaches its closest approach, the black hole, tidal forces will just completely shred it to part and there'll be a big accretion event and the black hole will go into fireworks. I think you can probably tell by my tone I didn't believe it. <laughs> so yeah, the two groups were a little competitive with each other. <laughs> okay, so that was the hypothesis. That it was going to break up and fireworks were going to go off and we were going to get to study black hole accretion physics as, um, the event, uh, as the accretion rate went to a much higher, higher level. And in fact, there's a whole other line of work that we, um, both groups are doing on studying how black holes um, uh, accrete matter and what the correct description of the emission um, uh, is. But AO adaptive optics allows you to see it in the infrared, so it's the variable red thing in the middle. But as you can see here, it's really variable. It varies all the time. So one thing that our group got very interested in is that you need a tool to tell you whether or not the latest blip is different than the last time it went blip because it's going up and down all the time. So it turns out that there's a professor of finance at UCLA who's an amateur astronomer, and there was a, uh, a postdoc in my group had, who had actually taken a, po um, a leave of absence to go work in the finance world. So they actually had the tools to talk to each other. And he pointed out, the finance professor, this is um, Professor um, Francis Longstaff, pointed out that the finance market looks just like um, the accretion onto the black hole. And of course the financial market, they're very concerned with whether or not there's emer an emerging second state in the market, so whether or not you can tell we're about to go into a, re a recession or something. And so, um, uh, but they, they have very different description of their data than we do. So we developed this, um, this new way of looking at SAD JSTAR to, to tell, and SAD JSTAR is the, the, the name of the black hole, whether or not there was another state from um, G2 getting close. The answer is there's no second state. It's just continuing to do what it does. And G2 survived its closest approach. It's still there. It's about the same brightness. But you definitely still see it being inter interacting. You see that tidal interaction. And that tidal interaction can only happen if um, that object is about 100 times larger than a typical star. So then the question becomes, how do you get an object being 100 times bigger than a typical star? And the answer is, you take a binary and you merge it. So if you get two stars and you merge them together, the star for a period of time uh, becomes much larger, in fact, about 100 times closer, I'm sorry, larger than um, the two initial uh, objects. And this is not unreasonable to think about. And again, it's one of those things that in hindsight, we should have been thinking about this. So if you take a binary, two stars and you put them around a third star, you get a three-body interaction. And it turns out that recently we've been thinking a lot about three-body interactions. And um, it turns out you can, um, the black hole will drive the pair of stars to merge. It drives it to merge because it pumps up the eccentricity and so high that you can get these merger events. And we're seeing tons of these objects now at the center of the galaxy that seem to, um, to look like mergers. Of course, in the process of merging, you can strip off the outer envelope. And then the most recent thing that I think um, that I'm particularly excited about thinking about, actually, let me show you this. This is the rates of, of these things happening, is that about 20% of the population should merge. Turns out there's tons of binaries at the center of the galaxy. And LIGO is providing us with another reason to think about this. LIGO also sees a couple of unusual things. They see stellar mass black holes that are more massive than we thought they should be. And they're also seeing events that happen more often than we thought they should be. But they didn't think about what happened um, in their calculations. There was, um, there was very little work done on what happens if you have a binary star near a supermassive black hole. And so what that, um, what that does for you is it provides you with a mechanism to build up stellar mass black holes to larger masses. And it increases your event rate because, of course, the density of stars goes up towards the center of centers of galaxies where supermassive black holes exist. So I think we're, we're very excited about a completely unexpected direction. Um, and our galaxy is clearly providing us with an unusual environment, an unusual opportunity to understand not only the physics of black hole, the astrophysics of black holes, but also gravitational interactions. So if nothing helps, I hope in the last hour I've convinced you that adaptive optics works, 
supermassive black holes exist, and we have a wonderful laboratory at the center of our galaxy for understanding the fundamental physics and astrophysics of black holes. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Yes. You think studying supermassive black holes like you did will allow us to predict the stock market? <laughs> well, now we have a tool, maybe. <laughs> So the magenta stars, which are not, or objects, which you cannot see in this animation, are objects where you see evidence of tidal interactions. In other words, if you look at the spectra, you see signs of tidal tails um, behind these objects. And the tail spreads out along the orbit. I mean, it's, it's cla it really looks. Because of the, uh, just the width of the line. No, you actually spatially resolve it. So in an image, you can actually see gas behind, so in, a, in, a, in a, what's known as a, well, in an IFU, integral field unit, which gives you both the imaging and spectral information, you see gas that trails the object space. So it's the first example of a spatially resolved object that is undergoing tidal disruption by a supermass black hole. So it is, it's spatially resolved. So you see that in these, in, in these magenta objects, clear, spatially resolved and spectrally resolved tidal interactions. I mean, yes. You're seeing that in the line, in emission lines? In emission okay. lines, yes. And, yeah. and so presumably what the emission line comes from is that you have low density gas that's being pulled off the, the object and it's being externally heated by all the massive stars that are, are in this environment. In addition, you see the, there's a dust cocoon around it, which we also see in our images. So the two statements I would make is that spectrally, so we have two measurements. One is of the, of the emission line, the hydrogen emission line, the bracket gamma line. Um, and then you also have three micron image, continuum images. The bracket gamma line measurement is the hardest measurement that's ever been made at the center of the galaxy. There's been a lot of controversy about that, uh, about that measurement. On the other hand, the images are about as easy as it gets because these are very red objects. So it's duck soup to make the imaging measurement. So you can. Are there, are there lines? Nope. Oh, sorry. You, um, there's one other um, um, uh, hydrogen um, emission line in the H band. So there's two, but the bracket gamma is much stronger. Yeah, yes, right. Yeah. Yes. With your adaptive optics, you are obviously able to correct for the speckle pattern. Mm -hmm. Since you are breaking up a lens of a certain size into smaller pieces, do you have some price to pay in terms of angular resolution? So you really do get to the diffraction limit with this because you have corrected some of the high frequency information correctly. But you haven't corrected all of it. So what that means is that if you think about the point spread function, you have a diffraction limited core and a halo around it that is the same resolution that you would have if you didn't make the um, corrections. So the question is then how much of the energy is in that diffraction limited core? For our observations, it's typically about 30% is in the diffraction limited core for adaptive optics. You can do the equivalent calculation for the early speckle data, and it was 3% of the energy was in a diffraction limited core. So we were really working with very little information at the diffraction limit. But that's, that's, how you, that's what it appears like in the data, is, the, is this halo um, around the diffraction limited core. Which you can separate out. So if you know, if you model your point spread function very well, then you can discern what's a halo and what's a separate source. So in fact, a lot of the work that we're doing today is in a very accurate description of the point spread function and how it changes slightly over the field of view. Um, turns out there was, and to do that, what you need is to know the layers of turbulence in the atmosphere. Because right now, the adaptive optic system just gets an integrated measurement of all the turbulence along one sight line. And if you go off that sight line, you're actually, your integral through the layers of turbulence is slightly different. So if you don't know the layers of turbulence, you can't model it. Well, you could, you could empirically model it. But it turns out that um, for the 30 meter telescope, there was sight testing equipment that was designed to probe the atmosphere, just to test all the possible sites to build this very large telescope. 
And so when that site testing experiment was done on the top of Mauna Kea, they donated this um, uh, equipment to Mauna Kea Observatories, run by, um, uh, by Keck Observatory and the, and the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. So every 90 seconds now, you can actually get measurements of these different layers of the atmosphere. So we're now pulling that um, data and um, have developed a model for taking that model plus your point spread function along the axis and developing how you expect it to vary across the field of view. But that's what allows you to very precisely tell what's your point spread function and then what's other, other sources. Because the field is incredibly crowded. Well, there's so many stars. We're actually limited by um, the confusion with other sources. So you only see the very, very brightest stars at the center of the galaxy. So this animation is a lot of fun. But in fact, the, the background is composed of the stars you can't resolve at the resolution that we're working today. And in fact, you cannot see a typical star. So the sun, we consider it being a typical star, but we can't get to um, the point where we see the typical stars. The stars that we see today are roughly eight times the mass of the sun. Those are the faintest stars. Um, and so we know there's just a huge population that's hidden behind the things that we're actually observing today. Uh, I must hear this argument behind your conclusion that most of galaxies have to have such a massive black hole in the middle. Apart from philosophical statement that we are unlikely to be so lucky to live near next to such a beauty, beautiful thing. What is another argument? You mean, what's the argument? Uh, why am I arguing that most, yeah, it starts off with we're nothing special. <laughs> so if we have, every time we think we're special, we're wrong. So that is certainly the first case. But it is two also, two yeah. sentences ago, you said sun is really typical. So we are lucky to be next to a typical star. Um, we are lucky. We are, um, but you could use the same argument, well, so the way I get, uh, again, if you think the sun is special, you're wrong. <laughs> if you think this, again, our galaxy is special, we're probably wrong. But it is also true, rather than just using that argument, it, that as we go and have the ability to look in other galaxies, um, there is clear evidence for a central mass, a central dark mass. And there seems to be this correlation. The only place where this seems to be violated, where you can make the measurements, is on the lowest mass cases. And there, the thinking might, uh, uh, seems to be that it may be the case that those are galaxies who just couldn't hold on to their central um, uh, um, black hole. But our galaxy, in the scheme of things, is actually sitting, uh, like our sun, kind of towards the low, low end. Um, and those other galaxies, that's observed by stellar velocity dispersion or mass? Gas, stars, or the cut. I mean, again, you have, there's been a, uh, a whole variety. Or looking for evidence of accretion. So looking at um, uh, for the X-ray signature or the the right the masers, right. So you know, there's a there's a variety of ways to look. So you have to ask, given your ability to look, do you see something? Um, and so the answer is. Um, for most things that should have a million to a billion times the mass of the sun, you do see that you do see them. One last question. Um, so there have been also discoveries of hypervelocity stars oh, yeah. by Ron Brown and others yeah. who suggest that you know, in order to, for that star to have such high velocity, thousands of kilometers a second, leaving the center of the Milky Way, they must have been accelerated you know, by passing very closely to CJ star. Um, and so the numbers that they give, and of course, that would reflect the population you know, whatever, millions of years ago. Is that consistent with the numbers you see here, the dynamical interactions you might expect from what you see. So there is a very nice picture that's being painted. So one of the things that people have um, wondered is how do you get the young stars that are actually in, I didn't go into the disc, diff, the disc versus what's inside the disc. So there's a very tightly um, bound group of, of young stars at the center. And people don't know how to form them. But it seems that they may be connected to the hypervelocity stars, which are velocity stars that, uh, sorry, stars in the halo of our galaxy, so very far away, that have velocities that are high enough that they're escaping from our galaxy, and they seem to be ejected from the center. So the model seems to be that you have a binary star that did a three-body exchange where one star of the binary is captured by the black hole, and then the third body gets kicked out. So the numbers um, certainly work, and it's one more piece of evidence that binary stars are really an important piece of understanding the dynamics of what's happened at the uh, happens at the center of galaxies. Yeah. 
this is for the, the, the current political uh, season. <laughs> Shouldn't you be oh, worried about the future of astronomy on Monarchia? Like, ah. Okay, so Mauna Kea's, astronomy on Mauna Kea has definitely had a colorful past and is continuing in that direction. So when Mauna Kea started as an astronomical site in the 1970s, peop, um, it, was, it was very much welcomed. You know, astronomy um, is the number two in, uh, industry in Hawaii. It's probably the only place in the world where we can have an econom a huge economic impact. Of course, tourism is number one. But in the intervening time, it's interesting what's happened. Of course, and also Hawaii is a relatively re recent state. Um, and so in the intervening time, there has been a rise in the um, a rejuvenation of the native Hawaiian um, culture and respect for that culture, which is, in, is really important. And in that culture, um, as it's true in many native cultures, um, high peaks are sites of sacred grounds. We see this all the time in astronomy. So in Arizona, we face the same thing with the Native Americans. Astronomers want the same th sites that are, are sacred peaks. Um, so in the um, entering time, there has been a growing movement that's that I would say is centered on recognition of Native Hawaiians. It's, it's really about recognizing Native rights, and of course things have not been done correctly. This goes well above beyond astronomy. Um, so TMT faces an interesting battle. So while I think the 30 meter telescope has probably paid more attention to this issue than any other telescope that has ever been built on that mountain, the political movement associated with Native Hawaiians is also increasing at a moment when social media is also on the rise. So I think both sides have gotten much more articulate and there is a contested case. So we were given the permits to build, there was a, um, there was a, a challenge to that. So right now um, we're in the process, um, so it was a halt to the construction which, which was supposed to begin last April. And in fact that case is being heard this week. Um, so I think we'll very quickly find out um, what the official view on, in Hawaii is on this telescope. You, you, your answer was about the past and the present, yeah. which I happen to be familiar with. But my question was, what, what, what is Can we thought about the future? Well, okay. so, are people really worried, or do well, they figure God, it can't simply stop? You know, I think your, your framing of this question was brilliant. You know, we live in um, of times where we think we know what's going to happen, just like Brexit, right? We think we know, and then we're surprised. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I certainly hope that um, it, it do, that this is not a, a, a done deal, that Hawaii, you know, Hawaii will not accept another telescope. I think that's bad for Hawaii. I mean, it's a huge investment in STEM for, this, for, uh, for the US. Um, but there's plan B actively being pursued. It has to be pursued. And so at the time that the site um, was chosen, there were five sites that were surveyed. And of course, as this has become an issue, those other sites are come forward and said, we'll be happy to give you the permit. So there are three sites that are being considered as plan B. And um, again, um, the decision is roughly now between these three sites. Uh, okay, running with the plate. So I'm sure we can discuss this more about wine. Mm -hmm. so we, we probably need more wine to discuss it. <laughs> yeah, it's very complex. 